Last week we celebrated uh, 9-11. And I remember right after 9-11, reading an article by Peggy Noonan. And the article was entitled, Welcome Back, Duke. Duke as in John Wayne, not Mike Krzyzewski, okay? Not, nothing wrong with Krzyzewski, but make sure you got the right Duke. Welcome back, Duke. I'm going to do something I don't do a lot. I'm going to read quite a bit. I edited this down some, but th- this really captures my heart for what I want to see with men here at RFA Church. Here's what she said, and again, this is just a few weeks after 9-11. She said, a certain style of manliness is once again being honored and celebrated in our country since September 11th. I'm speaking of masculine men, men who push things and pull things and haul things and build things, men who charge up the stairs and 100 pounds of gear and tell everyone else where to go to be safe. And their style is back in style. We are experiencing a new respect for their old-fashioned masculinity, a new respect for physical courage, for strength, and for the willingness to use both for the good of others. You didn't have to be a fireman to be one of the manly men of September 11th. Those businessmen on Flight 93, which is supposed to hit Washington, the businessmen who didn't live by their hands or their backs but found out what was happening to their country, said goodbye to the people they loved, snapped the cell phone shut, and said, let's roll. Those were tough men. The ones who forced that plane down in Pennsylvania, they were tough, brave guys. And then Peggy says this. Here's what I'm trying to say. Once about 10 years ago, there was a story you may have read it in your local tabloid or supermarket tabloid about an American man and woman who were on their honeymoon in Australia or New Zealand. They were swimming in the ocean. The water was chest high. From nowhere came a shark. The shark went straight for the woman and opened its jaws. And she said, do you know what the man did? He punched the shark in the head. He punched it again and again. He did not do brilliant commentary on the shark. He did not share his sensitive feelings about the shark. He did not make wry observations about the shark. He punched the shark in the head. So the shark let go of his wife and went straight for him, and it killed him. The wife survived to tell the story of what her husband had done. He had tried to deck the shark. I don't know what that guy did for a living, but he had a very old-fashioned sense of what it is to be a man, and I think that sense is coming back into style because of who saved us on September 11th, and that's very good for our country. But do you know what also follows manliness? The gentleman. The return of manliness will bring a return of gentlemanliness for the simple reason masculine men are almost by definition gentlemen. Example, if you're a woman and you go to a faculty meeting at an Ivy League university, you'll have to fight with male intellectuals for a chair. But I assure you that if you go to a meeting of cops and firemen, the men inside will rise to offer you a seat because they are manly men. They are gentlemen. I should discuss how manliness and its brother, gentlemanliness, went out of style. I know because I was there when manliness went out of style. In fact, I may have done it. I remember exactly when. It was the mid-1970s, and I was in my mid-20s, and a big, nice, middle-aged man got up from his seat to help me haul a big piece of luggage into the overhead luggage space on a plane. I was a feminist, and I knew the rules and the rants. I can do it myself, I snapped at the man. It was important that he know that women are strong. It was even more important, it turns out, that I know I was a jackass. (laughs) I embarrassed a nice man who was attempting to help a lady. I wasn't lady enough to let him help me. But perhaps it wasn't just me. I was there in America as a child when John Wayne was a hero and a symbol of American manliness. He was strong and silent, and I was there in America when they killed John Wayne by a thousand cuts. A lot of people killed him, not only feminists, but peaceniks, leftists, intellectuals, and others. I missed John Wayne, but now I think he's back. I think he returned on September 11th. I think he ran up the stairs, threw the kid over his back like a sack of potatoes, and came back down and shoveled the rubble of the World Trade Center. I think he's back in style, and it's none too soon. Welcome back, Duke, and once again, thank you, men of September 11th. Isn't that great? I love that. I love that. I was reading that this week and reading our passage, and this thought hit me. 
I want RFA Church to be a place where men are godly gentlemen, strong godly gentlemen, and where women feel safe being in the presence of men like that. Honestly, that's what I want. So I want you to turn to Acts 16. We've been going through the book of Acts. We're at Acts chapter 16. And you know the background of this. Remember last week, Paul, Silas, and Timothy are now trying to figure out where to go on the missionary journey. They go this way, the Holy Spirit says no. They go that way, the Holy Spirit says no. Then they go this way. They leave the continent of Asia. They cross over the Aegean Sea, as we'll see today, and they go to Europe. And when that happens, the gospel went from Asia to Europe for the first time. There's another person who joins them, and that's Luke himself, the guy that wrote the book of Acts. Because in Acts chapter 16, he now uses the first person plural. He says, we did this. We did that. So now Luke has joined them as well. Paul, Silas, Timothy, uh, 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 Luke, going to these different places to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It says in verse 11, Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace and came the next day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony, And we were staying in that city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now, a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Now look at verse 16. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. So you see what's happening here. They've crossed, here's the map, they've crossed the Aegean Sea. They're now in Philippi. There at Philippi, they're starting to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And beloved, in this passage, if you dig deeply, Here's what you see. In this passage, you see Jesus honors women. That really goes against the the spirit of the age that Paul grew up in. The spirit of Paul's age, women were objects. They were not people. In fact, Jewish men had a prayer in their daily liturgy. Now, I'm, look, I'm just reading this thing. Don't get mad at me, okay? This is what Jewish men would pray in their liturgy every day. They would pray during Paul's day, quote, O oh God, I thank thee that I'm neither a Gentile. I thank thee that I'm not a slave. Are you ready? And I thank you that I'm not a woman. They prayed that prayer every day. In the Roman history textbook, Carrie and Schuller said that Roman husbands could put their wives to death and sell their children into slavery without having committed a crime. Classic historian Sarah Pomeroy said that husbands in the Roman society held the power of life and death over their wives. That's the spirit of that age. That's not how Jesus looks at women. Jesus honors women. He honors Lydia. And how do you see him honoring Lydia? Number one, Jesus sends Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke to Lydia. Remember last week, there's all this confusion. We're supposed to go this way, that way. Where are we supposed to go? The Holy Spirit goes through a lot of trouble to direct Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke in the right direction. And when they finally get to their destination, the city of Philippi, they do not send them to the mayor of that city. They do not send them to the governor of that province. When they finally arrive at their destination, these men find out that they were sent there by the Holy Spirit for one lady, Lydia. Jesus honors women. Second way that we see Jesus honoring women and Lydia in this passage is Jesus uses Lydia to start the church at Philippi. Verse 13, it says, Lydia and these ladies are meeting by the river. They're meeting on the Sabbath, so that probably means that they are Jews, but they're seeking the true God. Why would they meet by the river? Because an integral part of Jewish worship was ritual cleansing, and so they would do ritual cleansing at the river, and they would pray and seek God's face. And so Lydia's there probably leading this group of ladies. Paul leads her to Jesus Christ. Later on, she invites them to stay at her home. There are no hotels on that day, so they have to stay at private homes. They stay at her home. Later on in verse 40, when Paul and Silas are beaten, released from prison, verse 40, do you know whose house they go back to? Lydia's house. 
Lydia was used by God to start the church at Philippi. Lydia and her family get saved. That's, that's the, the original group. Then the Philippian jailer and his family, you'll see next week, they get saved, and that's, that grows the church. And so every time you read the book of Philippians, you can thank God for Lydia because God used a woman, not a man, to start this church. And I'm going to say this, and I, this is where y'all love me when I preach the Bible. Then when I say things like this, you get mad at me. She was not the pastor of that church. That goes against Paul's apostolic authority, but I want you to understand this. She was an integral part of, the, of, of God using her to start that church at Philippi. Jesus honors women. Third way that Jesus honors women is, uh, is Jesus affirms Lydia's leadership gift. And he affirms that in two ways. Number one, he affirmed Lydia's entrepreneurial spirit. You see in verse 14, it says she's a seller of purple. What does that mean? In those days, the most prized cloth was purple cloth. And they would take mollusks and they would boil the mollusks and it would make purple juice come out and they would dye stuff in it. So this is a very successful, well, probably wealthy business lady. And the Bible affirms that. Do you know several times in the Bible, it affirms a leadership entrepreneurial spirit in women? You see that in Proverbs 31 as well, where God affirms that entrepreneurial spirit. Lord had to correct me through my wife a few years ago. I used to, we would get these invitations years ago, and well, up to a couple years ago. Uh, Chad and Darling, you want to join a group over at our house? And I go, oh boy, I know where this is headed. It's direct marketing, come to my house, I'll sell you this product, I'll sell you that product. And I'll be honest, I just got, so, I'm getting tired of all these ladies hitting us up to come to their house to sell us direct marketing product, with, and I used to call them take advantage of your friends' parties. And one day my wife stopped me. She said, wait a second. You have ladies who are wanting to use that entrepreneurial spirit to make money to help provide for the families. Chan, I think we ought to affirm that, not get aggravated at that. And so now I affirm that. I'm still not going to buy you stuff, but I do affirm that now. <laughs> That's one way that you see Jesus affirming Lydia. A second way is he affirms her strong personality. Verse 15, she persuaded us to stay at her house. So she's just gotten born again. She's given her life to Jesus. She says, Paul, Silas, Timothy, Luke, where y'all staying? Again, there's no hotels here. We'll find somewhere. No, you're going to stay at my house. No, we'll find, no you're going to stay at my house. That word persuade, it's a very intense word in the original Greek. It's only used one other time in the Bible, and that's when the two disciples are headed to Emmaus. A man joins them. They don't know it's Jesus, and he talks to them, and their heart burned within them, and he acts like he's going to go a different direction, and they say, no, no, you're going to come back to our house with us. That's the only other time that word is used. It is a very intense word. Now, here's what that tells me. Lydia had a strong personality. She, she, have you ever met a lady like that? Godly lady, but strong personality. And the Bible does not say destroy that personality, let's break that personality. The Bible affirms that personality. Any way you look, Jesus honored Lydia. That's what Jesus does. Jesus honors women. But you need to listen to me right now. We live in a culture that in the name of women's liberation confines, enslaves, and dishonors women. We live in a culture, and I want you to think of how, I want you to think of how twisted and really misogynistic this statement is. Ladies, anything a man can do, you can do. You can do it better. You need to be like men. Why would you want to be like us? The implication is men, they're the ones to be desired. You ladies are lacking, so you can be just like us men. And the Bible never affirms that. The Bible affirms, ma'am, I have made you a, a daughter. I have made you a lady. There's something special in you. Don't try to be like men. Be the person God has created you to be. That's the message Jesus tries to convey. But I want you to see how Satan dishonors women. Look at verse 16. It says, a certain slave girl possessed by a spirit of divination. That's not what it says in the original Greek. The original Greek says this, a certain slave girl had a spirit of python, a python spirit. Now, what's that about? Well, there was a temple back in those days. It was the Temple of Delphi. Here's a, a picture of the Temple of Delphi today. We have the ruins. And you would go to the Temple of Delphi if you needed direction, maybe you wanted to communicate with somebody who had died. You, you want to go into the spirit realm you would go to the temple of Delphi, and there were oracles there, men and women, who would get possessed by demons. They would go into a trance, their eyes would roll back, and they'd start speaking. The demons would be speaking through them. 
Now, according to Greek mythology, there was a dragon that guarded that temple named Python or Pythias. He guarded that temple, and Greeks said one day the god Apollos, who's really a demon, comes down, destroys this dragon named Python or Pythias. And when he died, Apollos took on his spirit, that Python Pythias spirit. And Greeks said he would give that spirit to whoever he wanted to, and they would do this fortune telling or whatever. So evidently, this lady had that spirit, because that's what it says. She had the spirit of Pythias. She had the spirit of Python. She was not considered a, a person. She's considered an object by some men who take her captive, make her a slave, tell her to operate in this spirit. People would not pay her. They would pay the masters. These men were using her to make a profit. That's what Satan does. Ladies, in the name of liberation, he is using you and enslaving you. Now, guys, I need you to look at me right here. In this church, you and I can operate out of a spirit of Jesus that honors women, or you can operate out of a spirit of Satan that dishonors women. Now, if your daddies have not had this conversation with you, and I'm not saying that flippantly because many of you came up in a home where there is no father the rest of y'all can snooze for a few minutes. Fellas, I need to be a daddy to you today, and I need to tell you how men treat women. I, I need to tell you how to operate out of a spirit of Jesus. Jot this word down in your study guide. Put this word down, faithful. Faithful. Husbands, when you stay with your wife and kids, you are operating out of a spirit of Jesus. When you abandon them for a newer model or an upgraded model, or some lady in your office who now knows how to wink at you, when you abandon your wife and kids, you are now operating not out of a spirit of Jesus, you are now operating out of a satanic spirit. And forgive me, I'm getting old, I'm getting crotchety, I'm not sleeping as well as I used to, but I've had about enough of this. I've had to deal with it in this church, I met a pastor last week, and he talked about some uh, family that had left our church and went to his church. I said, do they go to your church now? No, because the husband abandoned the wife, abandoned the kids, and he's now a leader at another church. And beloved, if, you're, if your idea is the, the number of sex partners I have determines how much of a man I am, that is a twisted, satanic look, view of this thing. I had a, now I'm not trying to be crude, I had a dog that had a lot of partners. Anytime a dog was in heat, his nose was in the air, and he would go have sex with a dog. That did not make him a man. That made him a dog. Now, he's dead now. I think God killed that dog because he did. I'm joking. But kids, God did not kill the dog. Multiple sex partners does not make you a man. Saying... That is the woman I said yes to. Those are the kids we have made together. And I don't care if hell itself comes against me and my family. I'm not leaving them. When I was a kid, now, y'all ever heard of the Alamo, the Battle of the Alamo? Now, when I was a kid, we moved to Texas. I was nine years old. And so I really got into to the Alamo. Because if you move to Texas, you got to be into the Alamo. And so I would, I'd watch movies about the Alamo. I'd read books about the Alamo. And I remember when I was a little kid, um, you know, you know this, I don't know if you know the story. The, the, the Mexican army comes in. 3,000, 4,000, and they come in and kill 150, 200 uh, of the Texas defenders. Every one of them died. I remember reading one book as a kid, and it said this at the very end. Davy Crockett died at his post. Jim Bowie died at his post. William Barrett Travis died at his post. And I remember asking my mom, I said, what does it mean they died at their post? I remember I asked her this. I said, was there like a big post in the ground, and that's where they were? She said, no, that's what that meant. She said, here's what that meant when they died at their post. The commanding officer would say, that part of the battlefield, you're, you're to defend that battlefield. You don't run. You don't hide. I don't care how many enemy come. That's your part of the battlefield. You stay there. You, that's your part of the battlefield. I don't care who comes at you. I don't care how hot the battle gets, how many bullets fly. That's your assignment. You stay there. You, that's your assignment over there. I don't care how many people come and get that's your assignment. You stay there. I don't care how many bullets fly around you. That's your post. And Davy Crockett died at his post. Bowie died at his post. This per 
Would to God we had a generation of men at RFA Church that will die at their post. I don't care what comes against me. I don't care what comes against my family. The commanding officer have said, that's your family. That's your wife. Those are your kids. You stay there until you die. You don't go run and switch families. That's your post. You stay there. Faithful, operating out of the spirit of Jesus. Here's another word. Jot this down. Music. The music you listen to originates either with the spirit of Jesus or spirit of Satan. So here I go again. I'll say it again. Fellas, if you have on your playlist songs that refer to women as bitches or whores, that's satanic and it needs to be removed from your playlist today. Godly men don't objectify women by listening to that kind of mess. But pastor, it's my culture. Then your culture is wrong. Take it off your playlist. Here's another one. Jot this word down. Speech. The way you talk to women reveals either a spirit of Jesus or a spirit of Satan. Now, I've got to hit this because we've had some challenges with this. Big church like ours. Now, smaller churches, you don't have this problem. You have, and I'm not saying that to denigrate smaller churches. It's, hard, it's harder to pastor smaller churches than it is larger churches. But if you have 100, 150 people in a group, you can tell when a stranger comes in and everybody's kind of like, welcome, but, but your, your antenna is up. A church like ours we have people slipping and out sometimes. It's not just our church. Don't everybody run and scream leaving RFA church. Every large church has this challenge. I don't know if ours is compounded because we're down the road from the strip club and people, I don't know what it is, but we have that challenge just like every other church. Of men coming in and thinking it's a meat market and I can meet women and I'll just start putting out my feelers here and I'll start talking about how you look sexy and you look hot and you look whatever. Listen, here's my new standard. If I would not allow you to say that to my wife or daughter, I'm not going to allow you to say it to any other lady in this church. That's my new standard. And I've had... A... <laughs> I have let people go from this church, people I like from this church, because they violated that standard. I had a pastor who said, Pastor Chad was mean to me because he found out when I was young, this thing happened to me, that happened to me. No, no, you're a creep and you're preying on ladies in this church. And if you prey on ladies in this church, you will leave this church. Because Acts 20 says, savage wolves will come outside to try to devour the flock. I'm a good shepherd. I do a lot of bad things. I don't do things right. I could be better as a shepherd. But one thing I do is I protect the flock. And fellas, now you say, well, it's just words. Here's what Jesus said. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A man that degrades a woman verbally means he is a wolf and he'll objectify that woman and there's no telling what else he will do if I let him stay. And so, does it, fellas, that make sense? We, we need to verbally affirm women, not degrade women. Here's another one. Computer. I can look at your computer history and tell if you're operating out of a spirit of Jesus or a spirit of Satan, men. It's got real quiet in this place. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that again. <laughs> Fellas, I can look at your computer history and tell if you operate out of a spirit of Jesus or spirit of Satan when it comes to women. Here's another one, jot this word down. Actions. When you are acting chivalrous, you are operating out of a spirit of Jesus. You understand what I mean, chivalrous? I know we don't use that word anymore. You know what I mean by chivalrous? That means men deferring to women, men's actions honoring women. Let me give you some examples of chivalry. And again, some of y'all, why is he telling us all this? And I don't mean this in a bad way. Some of you, statistically, half of you, statistically half of you come from broken homes who have never had a father say the kind of things I'm saying right now. And so if you're a guest and I'm making you uncomfortable, I'm sorry, but I got to do some 101 remedial stuff right here, Okay. The way you treat women, your actions, show that you're either operating out of a spirit of Jesus or a spirit of Satan. So when, when you're operating out of a spirit of Jesus, you open doors for women. Now, look, I, sometimes I'll forget my truck doesn't have the little beep beep whatever things. I have to unlock my door first and go around. Uh, so look, I don't always open the doors for my wife. I try to, though. 
And fellas, when y'all leave today, I'm going to stand right there at the front. I'm going to watch and say, how many of you guys open the door for your women? <laughs> Men open doors for women. That's just what you do. Here's another one. You stand for women. You don't stay, you stand for women. If you're on a subway or train or whatever, and, and uh, all the seats are taken, and a woman comes on, you give up your seat for a woman. That's just what men do. Women, if you want to know if you should date a guy or marry a guy, let me give you a piece of advice here. Look how he treats two people. Look how he treats his mother, and look how he treats waitresses. If a man doesn't treat his mother right, and he doesn't treat waitresses right, he ain't going to treat you right. And while I'm talking about waitresses, I uh, went and had lunch a little while back, a couple weeks ago, and asked the waitress there. I said, and she, I said, is it true Sunday afternoon is the worst time to be a waitress? She said, yeah. When all these people get out of churches everywhere, they don't tip, and they're meaner than everybody else. Hey, on Sunday, we ought to tip better than everybody else and be nicer to everybody else. A lot of those ladies are single mothers trying their best to raise kids. Well, what if I don't give me good service? Then you tip them more. Listen to me. I tip based on who I am, not how they do, okay? And so we need to honor these ladies. Ladies, I'm going to tell you something. I, I, I told you one of my pet peeves. You date a young man that sits in the driver's seat on his phone while you're out pumping gas in the rain, you need to run as far and fast from him. That is not the, I'm not a prophet, but I can tell you that's not the guy for you, okay? No, no, look. Does this make sense? Jesus, listen to me, Jesus honors ladies like Lydia. Satan dishonors women like that slave lady. Now, ladies, let me just say this real quickly. Here's what you can do to help us honor you. Now, guys, if they don't do any of this stuff, you still honor those ladies. If, if they don't do anything I'm about to tell you to do, you still honor them, okay? But here's what y'all can do, ladies, to make it easier for us to honor you. Number one, let us lead let us lead. Genesis 3.16 says this. As a result of the fall, okay, Adam and Eve sinning, humankind falling, women will constantly try to be leading the family. It just happens. My wife, when we were first married, she admitted. She said, look, I, I thought I knew better how to lead the family. I was constantly telling Chad, you need it this way, that way. My daddy always did it this way. My daddy did it that way. I started to hate Darla's dad because my daddy did it that way. Holy Spirit spoke to her one day and said this, you are not his personal Holy Spirit. You pray for him and I'll take care of the rest. You just pray for him. And she said, when I finally allowed you to lead and I would pray for you, and when you'd mess up, I'd pray for you. And when you didn't lead the way I think, I'd pray. She said, I did a lot of praying in those early years. <laughs> she said, there was a liberation that came into our family and our marriage. Let us lead. L ladies, support me while I try to lead this church. Philippians 4.2, the same, this same church that Lydia started several years later, Paul has to write them because two ladies in the church are about to split the church. Did you know that? Philippians 4.2. Now, again, I'm, I'm just 80%. If, if, if there's trouble in the church and somebody gets mad and they're leaving, whatever, 80% of the time it starts with the ladies of the home. We men like to say, we're the spiritual leaders of the family. We're not the spiritual leaders of the family. If the husband hates the church, but the wife loves it, nine times out of 10, they'll stay. If the husband loves the church and the wife hates it, nine times out of 10, they'll leave. Again, what, what I'm asking you ladies to do is understand we're not perfect. We're not making, we're, we make mistakes, but let us lead. Second thing you can do to help us honor you is verbally affirm us. I, look, we're babies, we need to hear you say at least once in a while, I thank God for you. I believe in you. I love you. I'm proud that you're my husband. Verbally affirm us. There is a trend in our society to not do that. You watch Everybody Loves Raymond. Deborah is always telling Raymond what an idiot he is. And it's good for a good laugh, but it's not good laugh for the Christian home. Ladies, we need to make sure that we're affirming our husbands. And again, this is not anything new. In the Old Testament, David King David says, man, I'm going to go on fire for the Lord. I'm going to pursue God. I'm going to seek after God. And David begins to worship God and begins to dance in the presence of God. And his wife, Michal, is watching him, and she rolls her eyes. Good grief. What an idiot. He's embarrassing me. I mean, it, all, it goes all the way back to the Old Testament, but verbally affirm us. Third thing you need to help us is be a godly woman. It's a lot easier to affirm a lady when she is pursuing God. 
Peter says this in 1 Peter 3, 3. He says, ladies, he's talking to ladies, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, putting on fine apparel. Now look, he's not saying, watch it. He's not saying, let yourself go and be ugly. That's not what he's saying. Here's what he's saying. If you're a godly woman, your goal in life should not make, be to make head spin and mouths drool. No, your goal in life, to even the way you dress, should be to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. I know God looks at the heart and man looks at the outside, but when you dress a certain way, sometimes, ladies, you are sending a message that some of you may not understand that you're sending. Does that make sense? And so my rule is just cover and conceal. That's it when it comes to dressing, all right? Rather, let it be of a hidden person of the heart with an incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Now, when he says gentle and quiet spirit, he's not saying, ladies, sit down and shut up. That's not what he's saying. Put, put this word outside. Put the word dignified or classy out there. Really what P Peter's saying is, look, ladies, if you're going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, man, be dignified. Show some class. Does that make sense? And it says God loves that. God finds that precious. Not this brash, loud, trashy thing that's so popular in our society today. Ladies, listen to me. Your role model is not Abby Wambach from the U.S. soccer team. That's not your role model. Your role model is not Cash Doll, Little Kim, and the rest of the gang. Your model should be Godly women who walk with the Lord Jesus Christ that have the sense of class, of dignity, of self-worth. I'm going to tell you something. The Lord loves that kind of stuff, and we men honor that kind of stuff. Now, does this, does this make sense? Beloved, I, again, here's, let's boil this back down. I want to create a culture at RFA Church where men, men honor women, where men are gentle men. And they treat women in this church with respect. That's what I want. I want men to be men. Now, again, here's what amazes me. Some stuff that were simple 101 things 25 years ago will give me grief this week. People will want to get in touch with me this week and take issue. And so if you want to get in touch with me, email me at cconnell at... Um, <laughs> I know this is not politically correct or whatever. It goes against the trend of our society. I went, okay, y'all make fun of me, but my wife needed me to pick up some hairspray at Ulta a little while back. <laughs> and so I walk into Ulta, and a young man with makeup comes and says, sir, what kind of makeup are you looking for today? <laughs> are you talking about for me? And I said, do I look like the kind of guy that wears makeup, Carhartt jeans and boots? I want some for my wife. And my wife says, you need to pray for them. Just love them and pray for them. I love them and I pray for them, but that is exhibit A of where our society is today. And I want godly men, listen to this, watch this. I'm gonna start wrapping up here. I want godly men to be a combination of strong and sensitive. Bold, strong, uncompromising, and tender. That combination of strong and tender, strong and sensitive, the world is hungry for that. Let me get, look, Jesus Christ, strongest man who ever lived, hung on a cross, took on the forces of hell, crushed the head of Satan under his feet, strongest man who ever lived, and yet we see him in the Bible having kids running up to him, and he's blessing those kids. Strong and tender. I just read about the Titanic a little while back. The ship is going down, only a few lifeboats, only a few people can be saved, and these big, strong men that could punch ladies and throw them out of the way and say, I'm taking that lifeboat. These men stepped out of the way and said, ma'am, let me help you onto that lifeboat. Knowing helping those ladies onto the lifeboat meant they were going to die. Strong and tender. I was reading a, uh, or listening to a lecture from a professor a little while back. His professor was lecturing on the Civil War, and he talked about one particular general in the Civil War. He said, before the war, General Winfield Scott had called this man the most handsome man in the entire army. The man's wife became an invalid at a young age. And so now you have a handsome man being stationed all over the place with an invalid wife. But he says, there's not one hint of impropriety. He, was, he stayed faithful to that wife. 
Civil War came. Shortly after the Civil War, he said this college student is in his dorm looking down, and he says he sees this, this general, former general, He's pushing his invalid wife in a wheelchair. And he said the man every now and then would stop and push the hair out of his wife's face. He'd push a little bit further. He'd bend over and whisper things in her ear. This man said he was almost feminine in the tender way he was treating his wife. And that college student said, then the thought hit me that this is the same man who just a few months before had stood in one spot of the Battle of Cold Harbor and calmly instructed his men while 2,000 people dropped dead all around him and bullets flying all over the place. Strong and tender. Fellas, let's be strong, but let's be tender and godly and kind. Let's treat women the way Jesus treats women. I want to do something. Would you stand with me right now? I have never, I have never seen our marriages under attack the way they are right now. I've never had so many single mothers coming to our church who were abandoned by men. It breaks my heart. It honestly, it breaks my heart. I asked an old timer a little while back, I said, you've been preaching and pastoring a long time. Have you ever seen an assault on the family the way you're seeing it now? He said, absolutely never. I have never seen such a coordinated satanic assault on our marriages as I am today. Fellas, two things you can do to make sure the enemy stays away and doesn't have victory in your house. Number one, make sure you and your wife and kids are born again and saved. And number two, pray for your family. I mean it. I shared this first service, I don't know if it's a prophetic picture, whatever you want to call it, but I just had this picture that as we men, as the spiritual leaders of the family, are praying for our family, this impenetrable bubble just starts to come over our marriages. And Satan attacks and tries to hit, but he can't because there's a prayer shield over our marriage. Not a hedge of protection. I can take down a hedge with a pair of trimmers. Not a hedge of protection. I'm talking about an impenetrable shield of protection. So, fellas, can we do this this morning? Can we pray for our marriages right now? I, I'm going to ask you to come. Now, ladies, let me just head some things off the come. If your husband doesn't come forward, doesn't mean he doesn't love you, doesn't mean your marriage is in trouble, and say that. If people come forward, it doesn't mean their marriage is in trouble. Have you ever heard of this term before? Have you ever heard of this preventative maintenance? Have you heard of that? I don't always just bring my car in when there's trouble. Sometimes I bring my car in before there's trouble to make sure there's not going to be trouble. And so for some of us, some of y'all marriages are in trouble. But some of us, it's just preventative maintenance today. But I just, I felt at first service, I feel at this service, that we need to cover our marriage with this shield, this bubble of protection. And I'm going to lead us in that. Would you come right now? If, if you want to pray for your marriage, fellas, come with your wives. Bring your wives. Bring your wives. Husband and wives. I'm sorry. Go back. Get your wives. Come back. Okay. I should have been more specific. And again, why don't you come forward today? Yeah, you can just, whatever. You can pray right there if you need to. There's just something powerful, I think, about publicly saying to God, Jesus, and the forces of hell itself, this family belongs to God. Husbands, place your hands on your wives and just for a few moments, thank Jesus for those wives. Would you do that? You know, just, I know it's awkward, I don't care, just do it. Jesus, thank you for this wife. Thank you for this godly woman. Thank you for this woman that you have brought into my life. Thank you, Jesus, for this spouse. And then, ladies, I want you to turn and, and pray the same thing. God, thank you for this husband. He's not perfect and he makes mistakes, but he's mine and I love him and I thank you for him. Your husbands, and they, <laughs> they may have not heard that in a long time. They may have never heard your voice saying, I thank God for you. Some of y'all's marriages have been through the storm and you're still standing wind and the waves have beat your house and your house is still standing. Thank you, God. 
Just thank God for a marriage that's still together. Now, men, husbands, I want you to do this. I want to lead you in prayer. I want you to say something like this. God, by an act of faith, I give you my marriage. I put my marriage in your hand. Would you say that right now? Father, in the name of Jesus, I give you my marriage. Say it again. Father, in the name of Jesus, I lift up my marriage and I put it in your hands right now. I give you my marriage in the name of Jesus. Father, protect my marriage. May the forces of hell not come against my marriage. Father, in the name of Jesus, while everyone else may fall, I will be... (laughs) I will stand at my post until the day I die. God, I give you my marriage right now in the name of Jesus. And Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak prophetically over these men and women right now. I proclaim no weapon formed against this marriage will prosper. Not the weapon of divorce, not the weapon of infidelity, not the weapon of pornography. No weapon formed against these marriages will prosper. I proclaim that you have taken this man and this woman and have brought them together and what God has brought together that no man separate in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray protection over our families. I pray that impenetrable shield over these families. I proclaim that the God who began the good work in this marriage will carry this work on to completion in Christ Jesus. Raise your hands and receive this Hebrew blessing of your marriage right now. Now, now, look, I want this blessing to penetrate your ears and your mind and go to the heart of your marriage right now. Yavarekka Adonai Bishmareka Yer Adonai Penav Elakavikuneka Esa Adonai Penavalecha by Sim Lacha Shalom. The Lord bless your marriage. The Lord keep your marriage. The Lord make his face to shine upon your marriage. In other words, may there be joy in your marriage. And may the Lord give you peace. May the Lord give your marriage wholeness, health, prosperity. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you, beloved. Let's go out there and let's change this world for Jesus Christ. God bless you.